Welcome to the plenary session of Viral Politics. This is a two-day symposium. I'm Associate Professor Evan Kirksey, um, hosting this event from ADI Geelong. That's the Alfred Deakin Institute in Melbourne, Australia. And um, today we have a, a group of really fantastic international scholars um, who are uh, joining us from, from Europe. Um, this is a film that's uh, uh, been shot here in Melbourne by Jamie Van Leeuwen, um, who's been documenting what life under the lockdown in Melbourne, Australia looks like. And, um, it, you know, over, over the course of our discussion today, we're going to talk about a lot of different things, not just COVID-19, um, but viruses and the, the marine environment and entanglements with global warming and the carbon cycle. Um, we'll be hearing about uh, uh, viral traces in, in wastewater, as, as well as histories of, of visualizing the virus and, you know, histories driven, uh, you know, often by, by fear of disease and death. Um, the, the three scholars that we have um, are Sriya Chatterjee, joining us from the Critical Media Lab in Basel, Switzerland. She'll be talking about visualizing the virus. Rachel Vaughn on the viral politics of wastewater epidemiology and Astrid Schrader, the transformative potential of marine viruses and a hopeful viral politics. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I'm uh, speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Kulin Nation um, here, here in Melbourne. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the ways that our, our event today um, and our lives in general are dependent on all manner of, of precarious labor. It's not just the violences of past genocides that I want to presence right now, but the ongoing precarity and the intensity of the precarity in, in the pandemic. We're speaking today on, on machines that were likely created and uh, electronic manufacturing facilities in Shenzhen, China. We're dependent on Uber drivers and um, all sorts of gig economy workers, as well as migrant, migrant laborers that are picking our food and bringing it to our stores. Um, so, so with that acknowledgement, both of country, but also ongoing entang entanglements, ongoing violences, I would like to hand the floor to Sriya Chatterjee, who's uh, gonna start off the, the discussion tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Evan, uh, for, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to this uh, plenary. Um, I also wanted to say how excited I am to hear the talks coming up um, just after this uh, and very much look forward to them. So just to give you uh, a quick sort of introduction and situate myself, uh, I'm an art historian and, uh, and I work with questions of political ecology, um, art, science and environment. So in my broader work, I'm particularly interested in figuring out how longer histories impact our contemporary lives. One of the reasons I'm here today is that I founded a, a digital project called Visualizing the Virus, which is also the title of my talk. Um, and the project was um, fun, uh, done with in inputs and help from many of the people here, especially Rachel Vaughn, who will be speaking right after this as well. I'll introduce the Visualizing the Virus project briefly, but first uh, I wanted to say a little bit more about some of the ideas behind it. Um, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, touched upon actually some of our history and um, visual culture's really fundamental questions, even if you may not, you know, sort of think so uh, on the surface. But the questions around who visualizes what and how um, what scale means, uh, questions of representation and multi-species relationships. Um, it has also forced us to take stock of the fact that processes of visualization uh, are implicated in forms of care as much as they are in political violence, xenophobia and institutional racism. Seeing or the inability to see something is political. So to think about um, the ways in which we visualize the coronavirus today uh, is also to delve, or, or the, um, um, sorry, that was me. Uh, <laughs> the virus is also to delve into longer histories of seeing, of colonialism and the spread of infection. So, um, here you see the British natural philosopher, Robert Hooke. Uh, who, along with the Dutch scientist uh, later, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek's experiments with magnifying glasses and microscopes, uh, that's what's allowed us uh, since the 17th century to know that most of life is invisible. To dominate a physical space in which you play so small a part 
has frustrated the Western imagination for centuries. So the enlightenment thirst for seeing and knowing things gave rise to the illustration of microorganisms and particles unseen to the human eye. However, it was also the application of early modern scientific methods in Europe that allowed European powers to infiltrate a diverse range of distant regions and served as a precursor to settler colonialism, slavery, and various modes of domination of natural phenomena, which in their eyes included climates, land, flora, fauna, as well as native peoples. So this really was the beginning of a very connected global world in which the flow of people and goods were mandated first by a mercantilist and colonial economy, and then gradually an expanding capital-driven international market. So the scaling up of invisible organisms coincided very much with the scaling up of the world, in a sense, from local self-sufficient communities to a set of global interdependencies. The, the global reach and the kind of high efficiency of, uh, of the virus, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, has or was, in a sense, also indebted to the scientific re revolution. So what I'm trying to say here is that the same impulse that allowed us to see the unseeable, which equipped us with the tools with which we visualize the virus today, also laid the foundations for its existence and proliferation. So our networks of daily existence have transformed us into an amorphous entity constituted through airwaves as well as uh, air travel. Um, and communicable disease and tracing their spreads visualizes the increasing connections of the inhabitants of the global village as both biological and social. The communicability of germs in, in an ever more sort of elaborate web of human existence and not just human existence. So giving the SARS-CoV-2 virus shape and form has been the first step to understanding it and relating to it on a human scale. So um, this is a really well-known image by now um, for many of us. In the very early stages of the pandemic, scientists and scientific illustrators worked over time to create images of this, you know, the snarl of nucleic acids inside a protein shell coated by a fatty sheath, you can see. Um, so these are illustrations done, uh, visualizations done by the structural biologist, David Godsell, who's been working at the intersection of molecular biology and illustration long before the pandemic. So he, he, he does this kind of thing uh, with other viruses. Um, and this is another visualization some of you will have already seen, um, but done by a scientist led by Patrick Kramer of the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen. Uh, and this shows how uh, the virus multiplies its genetic material, which consists of a single long RNA strand. In the process of visualizing viruses, it becomes important uh, to see viruses as uh, not as static beings, but as living processes. So um, this, as um, uh, Stefan Göttinger and Jean Dupré write, viruses are living processes that often mix and become part of other processes and hence contribute to a number of outcomes at the same time. So what I'm particularly interested in is not just the way in which scientists, artists, and people in their everyday lives have made the virus visible, but what other processes, you know, both historical and contemporary, does the virus make visible? So by this, I really mean the longstanding, I mean longstanding inequalities, be it of access to resources, healthcare, vaccine imperialism, xenophobia, and so on. So the word contagion means literally to touch together. And one of its earliest uses in the 14th century referred to the circulation of ideas and attitudes. So as Priscilla Ward writes, contagion is more than, uh, more than an epidemiological fact. It's also a foundational concept in the study of religion and society with a long history of explaining how beliefs circulate in social interactions. The circulation of disease and, circulate, and the circulation of ideas were material and experiential, even when they were not visible, right? So both uh, displayed the power and danger of bodies in contact and demonstrated the simultaneous fragility and tenacity of social bonds. We're gonna look at some very quickly actually, because it's, it's a short talk, but still we are gonna look at some examples um, to really explore this link between the circulation of disease as well as the circulation of ideas. So what you see here, um, 
is uh, something from West Bengal, where a community of scroll painters who practice the folk art of Bhattachitra, literally cloth painting, uh, and who have conventionally traveled from village to village and more recently to urban areas, performing their stories as they unroll their narrative scrolls. Um, and most of them have been recently painting and performing stories uh, about the virus. So this is Swarna Chitrakar, who, and uh, this is a seven frame scroll uh, featuring in its first, you know, you can see this very large uh, semi anthropomorphized figure uh, of the coronavirus. Uh, it has a large hungry mouth and arms, horns on the top of its head that you shouldn't miss. Um, but but it's, uh, so the invisible virus has been given this kind of monstrous form, but around it, you can see humans far reduced um, in, in scales of coughing and crying. Uh, and this was made very early on uh, in the pandemic. So uh, in early 2020. So although the early forms of Patachitra paintings and performances retold mythological stories and often encapsulated some moral values, Swarna Chitrakar and our compatriots in recent decades have been making scrolls, sometimes working with NGOs um, that narrate the symptoms, dangers, and measures to control uh, infectious diseases such as HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. Um, so while the coronavirus scrolls follow in a similar strain, no narrative is free from uh, the hazards of, circulate, of the circulation of, well, racist propaganda. Um, so the song repeats what it's picked up on the national news and names the, uh, names the virus, the virus from China. So, I mean, the, the dominant um, coronavirus outbreak narrative from the very beginning uh, stigmatized uh, particular groups and individuals. So uh, a live animal market, the so-called wet market in Wuhan reportedly spawned um, the new pandemic virus. But we know from researchers um, more recently, we're having worked with whole genome sequencing that there were 13 different strains of SARS-CoV-2 circulating when the outbreak was first detected in Wuhan, suggesting that the virus emerged elsewhere in China or even in another country. So we don't know. Um, regardless of this incidence of, um, sorry, no, not yet. Uh, incidents of anti-Asian racism grew all over the world. So not only in countries such as the US and the UK, but also in India, where uh, Indian communities from the northeastern part of the country uh, faced attacks in the country's metropolitan cities. So this strongly recalls what the historian Alan Kraut has called medicalized nativism. So Kraut describes how the stigmatizing of immigrant groups is justified by their association with communicable disease. It implies the most, the almost superstitious belief that national borders can pro afford protection against communicable disease. And artists such as uh, Amanda Bingbodi Bakia have responded to the recent bouts of anti-Asian hate. Um, this is in the US. Her series, the, um, I Still Believe in Our City, features uh, portraits of Black East Asian and South South Asian, Southeast Asian residents of, the, of New York, um, accompanied by anti-discriminatory messages like, I do not make you sick, and this is our home too. The Mithila region on the border between uh, India and Nepal is well known for its artistic tradition of Mithila painting. Since independence from the British uh, in 1947, the arts of Mithila have received Indian government support from the 1960s and the traditional modes of Mithila art have moved away from mud painting, uh, mud walls to paper and canvas paintings. So while various Mithila artists reflected on the situation, um, the pandemic uh, in different ways, uh, again, this is kind of the first wave uh, and this is a painting by the Dalit artist Naresh Kumar Paswan, uh, who's getting home, uh, shows a snippet from the great COVID migration in India, in which laborers in cities lost their jobs and were forced to return um, to their villages en masse, on foot, changing the structure of the city overnight and bringing the virus to areas that may have until then been unaffected. It is 
particularly poignant and difficult, uh, are difficult perhaps to be speaking of the first wave, um, given what happened uh, in India um, the second time round as well. But the well, India's second wave uh, is as much about the double mutation of the virus as it is, or as it has been about the government's handling of the pandemic, uh, a highly unequal healthcare system, a national shortage of oxygen, state elections and rallies um, that continue to be held despite the rates of infection. So the ability of the virus to mutate and spread rests on various social and political factors um, as well. So the COVID-19 outbreak sense reminds us that um, bodies are vulnerable and that not all bodies experience heightened vulnerability uh, equally. So in the midst of this growing crisis, the intimate uh, entanglements of individuals, communities, and the nation highlight multiscalar modes of vulnerability and care. So this is partly what the Visualizing the Virus Project seeks to do. So you can, uh, what you see here is a screenshot uh, from, from the homepage and um, the link to it as well. So it's, it's a digital platform through which audiences can visualize and understand um, the coronavirus pandemic from a variety of perspectives. And it aims to center the inequalities that the pandemic makes visible. Um, gaps between the humanities, social sciences and natural sciences are hard to bridge. And this means that pandemics are often studied without considering the many interconnect, their many interconnected histories. So visualizing the virus uh, connects insights from different disciplines to create a collective digital space for exactly such a con conver uh, convergence. You'll see what you mean, uh, what I mean when you um, go to the website. I'm not gonna do um, a walkthrough of the project, uh, but what I will do to finish is to point you to the website and hope that you can uh, explore it. We add new content uh, every few weeks, so sign up to our monthly newsletter um, for updates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surya. That, that was a really brilliant uh, uh, talk. And for those of you who are listening live on YouTube, uh, feel free to type questions in, into the chat box. You should see it on, on the right-hand side of your screen. I'm also happy to take questions uh, afterwards in the discussion as uh, whatever is maybe I'll, I'll just jump in with one um you know you talked about how um these histories of visualization um are engaged sort of um arise out of a scaling up of industrial capital and modernity you know marx talked about um contradictions of capital that produces a, a kind of crisis tendency um as the modern project both produced these kinds of viruses that are hyper virulent and quickly circulate around the globe. And as we aim to visualize them, what, what do you make of these contradictory tendencies within, within modernity? Um, well, yeah, I think one of the things that uh, I'm really interested in thinking about is sort of what, well, what, what the, the question of borders has meant also uh, in, in, in the current pan pandemic and how that has divided um, a lot of communities as well. So in, in terms of like what, what it means to, um, how do you contain something? Um, and uh, it, it, is, it is a moment where it, it's very hard to know what, um, what um, like if, if there was a kind of international working together um, on closing borders that might've helped. Um, but if, if it's left to individual countries, um, that raises questions also about sort of the country's historical pasts and what, um, um, what, what kind of impact they've had on um, um, either with sort of fascist histories or colonial um, histories and so on. So I think there's, there's a lot to think about in terms of um, how we think about our contemporary moment in context of a pandemic, but also in context of um, histories uh, that are particular to the country and uh, its uh, attendant geographies in a sense as well. Thanks, um, Rhea. So, so Rachel Vaughn is up next um, from UCLA, uh, currently based in Italy. Um, she'll be talking about on the viral politics of wastewater epidemiology.
Okay, can everybody hear me okay? All right, uh, hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Thank you to our organizers and thank you to my colleagues. Um, my scholarship uh, falls at the intersection of food and discard studies and it's long addressed uh, waste metabolism, uh, revalue and questions about the very limits of edibility and of capitalism. My current uh, book project is exploring acts of food salvage and food redistribution and food redesign projects through uh, storytelling. And it's uh, really an analysis of a microcosm uh, of a macro issue. And in this oral history and ethnographic research, the dumpster, uh, the space of the dumpster comes alive as a resource utilized for uh, multiple and complex reasons, revealing really how precarity is often shamed and also how privilege functions materially through waste. And I think uh, no more so um, visible than when, for instance, celebrity chefs do food salvage to great praise and renown, as opposed to when community members uh, do so and are met with stigma uh, or policing, uh, as was the case this past February in, uh, in Portland. But today, I want to actually uh, explore a very different space and format of waste revalue, um, taking our pandemic now as an entry point into sewer shed epi epidemiology, um, tracing SARS-CoV-2 through feces. The uh, understories of pandemic um, waste impacts are quite vast. Um, from grappling with pandemic-induced food system and supply chain losses, uh, from livestock culling to um, swiftly reconfiguring major crop or product losses like grapes for wine suddenly turned into hand sanitizer or surplus dairy salvaged into cheese, from lockdown upticks into single use plastics, fears of hospital refuse management to consumer blaming obsessions with PPE waste. Pandemic waste has largely then uh, in other words, been framed as a sort of deficit or loss or management worry. Uh, wastewater tracing, on the other hand, has gained particular interest and praise and investment um, as a tactic of revalue and public health potential amidst outbreak. In her 2006 collection, The Ethics of Waste, Gay Hawkins inquires, quote, does the management of shit, a process that is at once technological, governmental, intimate, energize our ethical imagination or numb it? And I think this is uh, an excellent question to revisit in the outbreak centered light. So I'm gonna examine the viral politics of sewer shed epidemiological tracing trends as a kind of complex microbiopolitical tool for SARS-CoV-2 management and surveillance. And I argue that careful attention to the politics of waste must be a central outcome of this pandemic. To accomplish this, I'm drawing upon three points of analysis, which I'm not gonna cover in depth for time purposes today, but I'll just say primary lit review and digital ethnography, including uh, conference uh, attendance. So in Les Miserables, Victor Hugo refers to the sewer as the conscience of the city uh, where social truths are laid bare. And similarly, ASU engineer Rolf Halden talks about wastewater tracing using the metaphor of the body, of the heart specifically, as a site for revealing truths about certain exposures from the chemicals and quotidian products that are washed down the drain to the microbes we are exposed to and even sickened by. In his latest piece for The Atlantic, Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist Ed Young interviews virologists on the future of living with COVID-19 endemicity and differentiating between the importance of vaccines for individuals with the need for other collective health defense strategies for societies. Infectious disease specialist Samuel Scarpino discusses this with Young, and he talks about the need for, quote, a nimble, comprehensive system that might include regular testing, wastewater monitoring, genetic sequencing, Google search analyses. It could track outbreaks and epidemics in the same way weather forecasts offer warnings about storms and hurricanes, end quote. And last year, I joined the International Water Association's COVID-19 wastewater-based uh, epidemiology conference to hear microbiologists and environmental scientists speak on the global uses of this method. 
specialists reported what they found to be numerous positive reasons for continued use of wastewater surveillance, including that monitoring is already an established use for tracking uh, things like polio, norovirus, uh, hepatitis A, therapeutic drug tracing, opioids, and antimicrobial resistance, to name just a few. This occurs on the population level rather than on an individual basis, which some argued might shift stigma away from vulnerable populations or targeted individuals. This method was seen as complementary to other strategies like testing and vaccines and self-isolation. Wastewater monitoring reveals important time span differences of viral shedding, providing a snapshot of broader populations from pre and post symptomatic to asymptomatic carriers. The method is overall prized as an early warning, potentially more rapid surveillance system, sometimes a few days to uh, even weeks before clinical evidence. And it can be place even building specific, which is why college campuses are especially picking up on its use for living with viruses by aiding in the return to face-to-face -face campus life. There are now more than 200 campuses worldwide, uh, worldwide using these kinds of systems. And here are just three examples, one of which I'm gonna circle back to, which is the Arizona State one, but ASU, uh, MIT, and, and UC San Diego. Uh, some see this as a useful tool for citizen science initiatives or for implementation in low resource settings since tools for sampling range in costs and reflect community snapshots overall rather than individual tests. Conference attendees strategize ways to better talk about this tactic and report findings to their various publics. Uh, they address biosafety protocols and they discuss how to convey the absence of viral threat from wastewater to try to mitigate public uh, alarm. So to circle back to the Hawkins quote, uh, then in context of outbreak, sewer water has very much quote, energized the ethical imagination for collective strategies in the name of public health. Some researchers and laboratories even pivoted away entirely from uh, their specialties and projects to aid in SARS-CoV-2 tracing efforts. The uh, literature also, critique, also offers a number of critiques, um, just a few of which I mentioned here on this slide. I am and for time purposes, really just um, take a look at them. You know, different monitoring frequencies might result in different outcomes. There's a concern about virus decay in wastewater and how that might affect outcomes, differing technologies and testing capacities. Um, you know, the fact that identifying information can technically be extrapolated from feces, among a host of other bioethical concerns about data. The final question that I want to pose to everyone today, though, is what key insights into this methodology can scholars of waste and discard and science and technology studies uh, bring to the epidemiological table, so to speak, and why is it imperative that we collaborate interdisciplinarily? And I'll raise three exemplary points uh, just to really begin to start, start the conversation, uh, but historical knowledge, uh, attention to community consent and trust building, and attention to the microbial politics of monitoring and data. Cultural studies and STS scholars bring specialized knowledge and attention to long histories of lack of consent in medical science and technology practices that may resonate still. We bring knowledge of the disproportionate racialized, gendered and class-based policing of bodies, of neighborhoods and specifically of the waste of targeted communities. We bring a critical focus as to the politics of data, to the sometimes proprietary biotechnological tools with interest in that data. And here I'm thinking of, for instance, proprietary testing kits, um, and to the bioethical stakes of data's use. It is imperative that these diverse knowledge sets learn from each other so that the particular neighborhoods or communities uh, are not being targeted, are not being criminalized or disproportionately excluded from access to robust health resources as a result of data release. Uh, there are stakes uh, accompanying an epidemiological tracing method praised as useful expressly because it does not require individual or community consent or because it gains in geolocation targeting precision as this UC San Diego study exemplified through their use of automated systems. Um, and this is all even as environmental scientists uh, do strategize tactics for increased public engagement and trust building. Uh, Heather Paxson argues, quote, microbiopolitics offers in, uh, us an idiom for analyzing regimes of social management that admit to the vital agencies of non-humans for good and bad. 
a point that holds true in the entanglements of science, data, technology, infrastructural and microbial factors necessary for and illuminated by sewer shed tracing. Halden's own uh, ASU lab success story is one instance of such complexities, an example of scientists and local government and health officials working together over a virus, an example of how hyperattention to one neighborhood presumed at risk over multiple might have resulted in catastrophe, but uh, it did not. An example also of how the method was first being used in this very lab to track opioid use for proclaimed overdose uh, concerns, but perhaps also with the capacity for other problematic uh, surveillance outcomes in say different hands. To return to and tussle with those quotations from earlier then about sewers as truth tellers, as truth revealing, the viral micropolitics of wastewater tracing brings waste yet again into the pandemic forefront, revealing a twist in common narratives of waste as loss or uh, devalued materials deemed useless. The microbial vitality revealed, however, is not one dimensional or monolithic truth. Bodies do not shed the virus into wastewater in standardized amounts or standardized lengths of time. Sewers themselves are not infrastructurally uniform if they are present at all. Stakeholder interests are many. Uh, sewer shed data is thus profoundly insightful and also complex, um, at moments troubling even. It's messy and political and the fluorescent presence signaling SARS-CoV-2 virus found therein may have multiple truths and varied outcomes. And I will leave it there. Thanks so much, Rachel. That that was a, a really uh, delightful, uh, you know, tour into the um, undercommons, as 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 you mentioned. Um, I, I I loved it. Um, uh, Astrid, Sria, do do you have any any um, questions uh, for for uh, Rachel? Maybe just uh, here we go. I'll, I'll just ask all the questions tonight. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, part of, yeah, I, well, in part, you, you've stolen my thunder. I'll be talking about mi microbiopolitics on, on Friday. So it's, it's great to get the conversation going early. So, so I, I, I'm loving it. And, and I was wondering, you know, part of what I take from Paxson and thinking about, you know, these mi micro responses to dominant regimes of biopolitics is these local circuits of matter and meaning where things are resignified, where it's not sort of the one size fits all of pasteurization, kill everything, um, but it's kind of in a situated way, teasing out the effect and agency of particular microbes. And, you know, part of the story here is, is just detecting the pandemic virus. And I guess maybe, um, you know, in looking deep into the waste, um, what kinds of microbial possibilities or, or multi-species futures might, might we see in the runoff and in, in this undercommons in, in a microbiopolitical sense that's a, a situated good maybe? Maybe that's too, too, <laughs> too, too ambitious of a question, but... <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a great question. And I think it's one to kind of, that we also need to let sort of hang there. I mean, thanks for, thanks for asking. And I really do think that um, a lot of these local level examples can attest to it in so many different ways in so many different contexts, whether it was being used, you know, the coverage we saw last year of, you know, uh, national parks using the, uh, these strategies to uh, labs working together with local, you know, local uh, management systems and, and, and public health officials. There are lots of different localized examples. So I don't want to generalize, but I mean, the, you know, Halden's own case, his own research has long uh, worked on, you know, different factors uh, and different public health experiences of this. Um, and so, you know, uh, whether it's from, you know, just what, what can waste reveal? What does waste reveal about uh, in that, in that quote that I uh, um, used on the earlier slide, you know, he's talking about, you know, using, using sewer water as a source, much like for, for medical information, for basic medical information about human bodies. Um, so on the one hand, you can see the, the, the sort of examples in all these local instances of, of positive um, uses and, and outcomes. I think the question left hanging in the air for me is, you know, 
the, the complexities are, are very much apparent, um, but in different hands, it gets more complicated and complicated. And with, uh, and in different hands, whether privatized or public, um, uh, blended with the various technologies that are being implemented, uh, it gets more, uh, the, the stories get become even more complex. Um, and I think the geolocation example is one of those. On the one hand, it speeds up the possibility for having these community snapshots as opposed to um, uh, individual testing. But then on the, the other hand, I worry that, you know, could that then be used uh, as a tool that maybe replaces, uh, you know, I think one of the primary lit uh, examples talked about, you know, um, you know, uh, difficult or non working with difficult or non responsive communities. I mean, there's a lot of different meanings or takes on something like that. Does it then become a tool for replacing other robust uh, health services that are already unequally distributed? Um, so, you know, what do what multi species, you know, um, uh, sorry, I'm going from memory and your, your original quotation, but, but, you know, I think, um, you know, this, uh, you know, Heather's, Heather's quote is a really great use for us to think about these complexities and think about these entanglements on micro and macro levels. Um, and perhaps it reveals the possibilities for, you know, as it, as it has in certain labs, like uh, microbiome, um, you know, inventories or questions about uh, about access and addressing access to resources that were absent. Um, that might be, you know, a positive uh, example of the ways in which we could be aided by the presence of microbes. I also wonder on the flip side, though, yeah, you know, in different hands, what that might look like. Uh, and, and I will also say, just to tack on a third point, and then I'll be quiet, um, <laughs> is, you know, that the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater doesn't necessarily mean that you have an outbreak. Um, uh, at hand, right? Because you you are taking a community snapshot, and that may mean post symptomatic uh, presence. So I mean, there, there's a lot of complexities there about what you know what these you know microbial uh, microbes actually do, can can tell um, human agents. All right. So I think we're going to have a lot of really good crosstalk. Um, some of Astrid's earlier work um, has has been about um, you know rivers of waste that flow out into the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean and red tides and phantom dinoflagellates. Um, but tonight, uh, Astrid's going to talk about her, her newer work, and, and the talk is titled The Transformative Potential of Marine Viruses and a Hopeful Viral Politics. Okay, let me see if I can share. Okay, can you all see my screen and hear me? Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation, Erin. I'm very happy to be here and thanks for thanks to the co-presenter and the organizers. Um, so my paper is a very different is about a very different kind of critter. It's about the transformative agency of marine viruses, so not related <clears throat> to SARS-CoV-2. And I'm thinking with viruses here as both metaphors, material substances, and biogema geochemical processes. I'm after a viral politics distinct from a bio and geo politics that is neither catastrophic, apocalyptic, or that of terrorism, as anthropologist Elizabeth Pilvonelli proposes. So not all viruses are terrorists, as we will see. I associate hopeful viral politics with a hopeful notion of haunting and ghosts. So all my most of my recent work is about haunted microbes. So haunting is, uh, I'm trying to make a, a case for hopeful notion of haunting. Um, so begin with haunting in the Anthropocene before turning to the marine science. In a recent anthology, the arts of living on a damaged planet, ghost monsters of the Anthropocene, Anothing and colleagues discuss more than human bio and geosocialities guided by the figures of monsters and ghosts. For them, monsters are entanglements of bodies belonging to different kinds of species, chimeras, established mainly through symbiosis. The politics associated with monsters could be called symbi symbiopolitics, which is Stefan Helmreich's coinage. The notion emphasizes that the governance of life no longer solely proceeds through the management of bodies, of individual bodies or population, 
but to the governance of relations among entangled living things. So simultaneously promising and destructive, quote, monsters are the wonders of symbiosis and the threats of ecological destruction for um, Anna Singh and colleagues. Rather than entangling bodies and ghosts, uh, for the authors of these um, anthologies, um, rather than entangling bodies, ghosts uh, relate bios and geos. They help us, quote, to read life's enmeshment in landscape. In addition to entangling life and non-life, goals also modify time in the Anthropocene. They, quote, disturb our conventional sense of time where we measure and manage one thing leading to another, end quote. So the goals that guide them through haunted lives and landscapes appear more often than not as traces of past violences rather than life-enhancing entanglements. So for the editors of the Arts of Living on the Damaged Planets, ghosts announce a world haunted with a threat of extinction. For Neil Spubant and one of the editors, um, in the Anthropocene, time is out of joint and life is already geologic in a spectral sense in which the present proceeds from the future as we are looking now at our own extinction in the future. So in spite of this pessimistic outlook, Uban ends his discussion of a human caused eruption of a Malaysian mud volcano on a hopeful note. There is a promise in the inability to distinguish the bios from the geos, which implies for hope for a novel kind of collaboration between science and the politics of the otherwise. So I would like to dwell on this promise of the indistinguishability of bios and geos with the help of scientific accounts of marine viruses and their role in the global carbon circle. <clears throat> which may also suggest a link between transformative readings of science and a more helpful account of God, hopeful account of God, so a hopeful biopolitics. In other words, this paper is an attempt to sync bias and geos together through transformative agencies of marine viruses that I call elemental ghosts. For Jacques Derrida, ghosts are figures of justice that allow caring for memories and future relations. Ghosts undo the metaphysics of the present. As Derrida asserts, quote, present existence or essence has never been the condition, object, or thing of justice. Povinello's description of the figure of the virus is clearly informed by the biology of viruses, whose status as a form of life has never been settled by the philosophers of biology. As viruses do not reproduce or metabolize by themselves, they hijack the functionality of the host to perform this life-sustaining function. Their being does not qualify as a living thing, as long as life is assumed to be self-organized and self-contained. The biology that allows the association of viral behavior with terrorism could be updated, however. At stake is a refiguration of agency in relation to notions of life, <clears throat> and an approach to science. So, excuse me, hold on. <clears throat> so viruses trouble the distinction between life and non-life. They can be viewed as alternating between living and non-living phases, between chemical substance and living process, challenging the opposition between substances and processes, between organic and inorganic life. They are not only undoing spatial boundaries between organism and environment, but also temporal boundaries drawn when life gets associated with substances, with intention and potentiality, forward-looking, anticipating, and non-life with pure actuality or presence. Now, the word virus has its root in Latin and is associated with the venom of a snake literally meaning slimy liquid poison. Just as microbes used to be synonymous for germs before their importance as symbionts in all kinds of organism was recognized, until recently, viruses have been studied mainly as disease-causing agents, as they are now again. The sheer abundance seems to make them essential, however, to our biosphere. There are 100 million times more viruses on Earth and in the ocean than stars in the universe but they have been non-neglected as important actors in cycling and recycling of organic matter. New research on marine viruses challenged the view of viruses as mere, mere agents of mortality. Some virolo virologists go so far as to, to affirm that the survival of our species depends on viruses. 
to paying close attention to the biology and biogeochemistry of marine viruses may offer the possibility of a viral politics other than terrorism. So my point will not be to liberate the virus from the existential crisis. I'd rather like to sharpen and refocus it. So essentially a virus is basically a piece of DNA or RNA wrapped in proteins, which they don't produce themselves until it finds a living host to infect. It is merely a piece of chemical information. So here's a picture of a diverse form of viruses. Um, and I'm mainly interested in the alien looking one, the bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria, that kind of like UFO like uh, critters. Um, so viruses seem to have no problems alternating between living and non-living phases, depending on circumstances. They are said to come alive when they invade a living host, um, living cell of the host. This is at least as long as life is defined in terms of reproduction and requires an autonomous, autonomous unit or individual that produces and reproduces itself. But why should autonomy and individuality be a central criteria for life? In light of the ubiquity and importance of symbiosis for animal development and evolutionary transition, autonomy, individuality, and self-maintenance have become questions as criteria for the living, as Scott Gilbert argues, for example. And if multi-species cooperation and codependencies are the norm rather than the exception for the maintenance of life, then there is no reason not to regard viruses as part of life, argue philosopher of biology John Dupree and Maureen O'Malley. They consider cooperation a central characteristic of living matter. And they do not restrict aliveness to cells or organism, rather for them life emerges when species collaborate in metabolism, forming functional wholes. <clears throat> Here's a central question, however, is not whether or under what conditions viruses become part of life, but how they may trouble the distinction between life and non-life or bios and geos, which entails the trouble troubling the temporality that associates life's potentiality and not life with potentiality and non-life is pure actuality or presence. So a corollary of that trouble is a dissociation of material agency from lifeliness. So some commenters have been eager to affirm material agencies and have been speaking paradoxically of lifeliness of non-life. In a more recent essay titled The Ecological Vi Virus, O'Malley takes a slightly different view. Rather than emphasizing cooperation, she highlights a distributed ecological agency of viruses over a possible biological agency. So neither ecological nor biogeochemical actors have to be organisms. The ecological virus is not a tiny organism that aspires to cooperation or participates in a division of labor for the good of the community. Rather, viruses create a condition to replace themselves. In her virocentric ecology, viruses are becoming distributed agents associated with functional types. So such a view shifts our attention not from bias to geos, but from actions of organism, individual actions, concentrated subjectivities to distributed agencies that link viruses to the global climate system. In this view, life is understood in terms of interactions of multiple biological and biogeochemical agents, not all of which are living things. So such a view enables viruses to come to matter for the global carbon cycle. As main driver of mortality in the ocean, they recycle organic matter, change the rate of carbon fixation, have great influences on microbial community structures, um, and have great influence on my community structures. While they usually kill the host, marine viruses can be also be beneficial for a population. Considering that 98% of living matter in the ocean is microbial, it is astounding for how long the activities have been neglected in the models of global carbon cycles. It was long assumed that carbon produced from sunlight by photosynthesizing bacteria would simply move up the food chain to higher trophic levels. Bacteria in the ocean were thought to be exclusively regulated by grazers. So that's a grazing food chain on the next slide. That is high trophic levels. Now it is assumed that about 40% of them die due to viral infection. 
the linear model of carbon transit had to be corrected twice, as the role of bacteria and viruses gained increasingly importance. First, the so-called microbial loop was discovered, which was then further modified by the action of viruses called the viral shunt. These are fancy names for the observation that only bacteria consume dissolved organic um, materials that cannot be directly ingested by larger organisms. So when viruses kill bacteria, they contribute to a vast store of organic carbon that cannot be easily taken up by larger organisms. In this way, viruses divert the flow of carbon nutrients from secondary consumers, increasing the and increasing the recycling of organic material. How exactly the increased recycling of carbon in these layers affects the amount of CO2 in the air and the possibility of carbon transport into the deep ocean remains somewhat unclear. Here's another picture of the marine food, bed, uh, food web, a little more complicated. Another mechanism that scientists call the microbial carbon pump describes a temporal process that manipulates the lifetime of organic carbon in the ocean. So viruses actually convert short-term carbon flow into long-term carbon storage. And um, an estimate is up to 6,000 years that becomes interesting for carbon sequestration. So the details of these mechanisms are also still vague. <clears throat> so scientists agree that viruses influence the flux of carbon and nutrition on the global scale, but to what end remains uncertain. To make things worse, the action of viruses seems to be surprisingly local and is scale and context dependent, which is another source of uncertainty in climate models. So now to conclude, in contrast to Singh and Al's monsters that thrive in the symbiopolitical realm, ghostly marine viruses exist only on the move. Their ontology depends on the scale and the specific questions they are put to them. They are capable of mutating their ontologies. They can be destructive substance, a living process, or a distributed agent. The distributed agency modifies the stubborn link between liveliness and agency. As agents of mortality on one scale, viruses contribute to an increase of diversity on another scale. So I find hope in the, in the alterity and ghostly undecidability of what a virus is, its ontological indeterminacy, and the simultaneous demand to account for their existence and action in order to get a better picture of global warming and ocean acidification. Thank you. I'm sorry Thanks, if that was a long. Yeah, thanks, Astrid. That was really generative. Um, so there's uh, some questions that are stacking up on um, uh, YouTube that I can ask ask the group. At this point, um, none have uh, emerged for Astrid in particular. I've, I've got a question for Astrid, but it looks like Surya might as well. Go ahead. Um, do you want to go first, Evan? Or? No, 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 I've been asking all the questions. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so thanks, uh, Astrid. This was such a fabulous uh, talk. Uh, and one of the things that kept coming back to me as you were speaking is uh, the question of time uh, and what uh, what time means for this kind of uh, going between carbon cycles, ocean time, um, virus time, but also kind of virus mutation time versus uh, and working alongside human time as well. And I, I was wondering if you wanted to say a little bit more about how, how you think about this um, in your work. Yeah, that, that is a really, thank you for that. that, is a really big question. So I'm thinking of haunting in very different kinds of ways. And in this context, it is, um, so the, the main point is that the, um, that, well, the, the viruses modify uh, in, they modify the um, lung, um, how long the carbon remains in, um, it is not only just, um, they don't just modify meta, they also modify temporalities in the ocean, right? Um, so that is one, one uh, part of the agency. And one of the points is that the agency of the viruses is not necessarily related to, uh, to their liveliness or has nothing to do with them being alive or non-alive. So for this kind of transformation of the temporalities that has actually material effects for carbon sequestration, the, uh, it doesn't matter whether the, the central question whether the viruses are alive or not alive. So in, in, in they are, uh, the haunting here is 
um, yeah, is not related to to past violence as it is in 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 other narratives, but is related to to an um, temporal indeterminacy in, in a way, um, and uh, and a specific agency that is uh, yeah dissociated from life and death. If that helps a bit. Yeah, thanks. This is super interesting. Thanks. So I'm going to go back to a, a question from Frederick Keck uh, to Saria Chatterjee. Um, so this is in dialogue with my uh, earlier question about the contradictions of capital and the contradictions of the modern project that's both proliferating and visualizing viruses. Uh, Frederic asks, it, it would be nice to think about how artworks can attenuate or inversely intensify these contradictions to move forward. So uh, yours to respond, Sria. Yeah, thanks, Eben. Having sort of uh, DM'd with Eben, I realized that um, I was cutting in and out a bit, and I did. I heard nationalisms and um, um, capitalism rather than contradictions of capitalism. So my my answer to Evan's question actually made no no sense to what he was asking. Uh, apologies for that, but I'm glad um, that we can talk a little bit um, about the contradictions of capitalism because this is so key to um, a lot of what we're <clears throat> thinking about in in the context of the pandemic uh, as well because. I think if you think about sort of uh, vaccines and um, like the the ability of um, uh, capitalism to also in some sense produce uh, um, vaccines, but relating that to vaccine imperialism, and I think um, also to think about healthcare systems as well as mutual aid groups and how how artists have been specifically thinking through what mutual aid means in a time where you know the um, you are in a system where you are meant to be uh, provided for because there, you know, you, there is uh, not by the state, but by, let's say, um, a, a capitalist system in a sense, because, you know, uh, there, there are efforts to produce vaccines, but uh, people are not, not everybody is going to have access to it and so on. So I think these kind of very um, specific uh, contradictions of capital are also very significant in the current um, in the current moment, and not just significant, but also kind of um, uh, being visualized. I think by by specifically artists who are working with socially engaged projects, and I think mutual aid uh, is one uh, one example um, of um, of ways in which people are kind of actually doing things, but also allowing that allows you to reflect on kind of larger uh, inequalities um, as well. Thanks, Rhea. Um, so there's two questions for Rachel that have emerged also from Frederic Keck and, and Lyle, Lyle Fearnley, um, one of our speakers on, on Friday. So Frederic asks, what should we do with the Hugo quote? Is there more truth in the filth or more simply weak signals? And then Lyle asks, Foucault's biopolitics had two poles, body and population. If microbiopolitics moves towards a microscopic scale, what might be the other pole in sewer surveillance? Neighborhood? Building? Thanks both. Um, with regards to um, Frederic's question, what should we do with the Hugo? And I'm going to pull this up so I have it uh, visible as well. Um, I don't know that it's, uh, I'm an oral historian by training. So the idea that there's gonna be sort of a bigger truth and a lesser truth is, is something, certainly something we, we grapple with in, in, the, in the field and, and really um, contend with. Um, so for me, it isn't so much that, I think I was struck uh, as I was thinking back to those points um, in, in Hugo's work where, you know, he's, telling, suggesting that the material says something, some, some sort of finalized truth that we can't, that we cannot escape uh, about society through, through this particular form of waste. And as I was sort of looking through um, interview materials from other laboratories, it struck me what um, Halden was saying, and that there were these sort of similarities about, you know, what is revealed there. But what also struck me uh, about both was this idea that there was this uh, a, a very kind of um, singular sense that, that that it was inescapable, and I think the thing that um, uh, I'm trying to sort of tussle with as I work my way through the, this primary literature is that 
um, you know, what, what we know coming from our fields is that they're, um, that, that this is much more elusive, that this sort of, this idea that um, there is more truth in the, in, in the, in the filth, as Frederic writes, um, to me is much more complicated. On the one hand, you have these community snapshots and they can uh, do, I mean, in, in, for instance, in the Milano studies, um, in, um, in some studies, I think in Barcelona, there were instances where um, they were able to retest samples um, that were uh, sampled um, by laboratories before and, and, and really backdate um, the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in waterways. Uh, so in, in sewer water. So on the one hand, this is a very powerful um, tool to, to say something and reveal something uh, using the, the microscopic. But the, um, but I think the thing that I still contend with um, in both of those quotes, not just the Hugo, is what it means and how it gets you, what it, what it translates to in its use is where I think um, there's, there's a lot more, uh, complexity and I'm not trying to sort of, um, you know, um, uh, I think, uh, microbiologists and envi environmental scientists are, um, you know, are trying to pivot swiftly. I mean, you see that in so many different lab cases, uh, and try to offer something here to the, to, uh, outbreak, um, cases. So my, uh, sort of critique is, is really about, you know, what we know from our fields about the, you know, there is no single singular truth. And the fact that these snapshots are much more complicated um, and, and can be used in much more complex ways than perhaps what we're acknowledging here. I mean, with these geolocation capacities, it's getting, you know, on the one hand, the primary literature suggests, uh, oh, you, you really can't reveal, you can't use wastewater to reveal personal data. But the flip side is, is that in, in fact, and this is where I can overlap a little with Lyle's um, point, is that the, the more targeted the technologies and the more targeted the monitoring, in fact, you can uh, uh, become more and more precise and more and more revealing. Uh, and I think we ought to um, think about that. Um, and, and I think, you know, environmental scientists are really going to have to tussle with the fact that, you know, some labs may not have a uh, certain training to, um, to, uh, in how the, in how the data is being, being delivered uh, in terms of uh, bioethical standards. And that was the, the, the case, in fact, for one particular study that just came out earlier this year was asking these, these kind of tough bioethical questions, I think, from Canadian networks. So um, I don't know if that also touched uh, as well on Lyle's question. Um, I'm just rereading it. Yeah, body um, population yeah. for Foucault. So do we have mi microbes in neighborhoods, microbes in buildings, or is there another poll to microbiopolitics that you want to uh, come up with? Yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> I, I think that it's even getting more specific the more that these tools and technology go. And a lot of that has to do with the resources of the labs and the, and the monitor, the surveillance projects that are underway. On the one hand, microbiologists during the uh, International Water Association conference talked about how, you know, it was much uh, broader. And, uh, you know, the Netherlands, for instance, was one of the first places to implement this as early as March, 2020 in multiple, um, at multiple sites, like seven or eight different sites. These were some of the earliest publications on this. Um, but now we're getting even more, now it's you know potentially neighborhood, depending on the kind of infrastructure that's available and depending upon the kind of tools and technologies and lab capacities. Uh, but then even building specific, um, perhaps, uh, you know, not perhaps, private businesses have, have started to really use this. So then we, be then it becomes a question of say monitoring workers or, so I don't wanna, I'm not trying to sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, create a false, um, you know, fear mongering here, but the capacities are rapidly changing with investment and interests. And I think the, those polls are important and, and we should pay close attention to those, those tools and the various hands on interests that they're, they're currently um, documentedly, you know, in. So Astrid, I see you have your hand up and I do still have a question for you, but go, go ahead. Yeah, if I may piggyback on Lyle's question about the microbiopolitics, uh, another question to Rachel that I also then want to um, extend to Sria. Uh, 
um, the microbiome politics in your case studies, Rachel, is this still a uh, governance of human population with the help of viral agency, or is the governance here um, um, expanded uh, to a multi species kind of community? So, the question that then asks about scales uh, is it really? If it's still governance of, of human population in which just agencies uh, figure differently, uh, then maybe the question of scale is a different one than other if it the the significant population that gets governed in the microbiopolitics is multi-species rather than just human. Um, and does, I, I does might, that make sense? I might jump in there, Rachel, while you're thinking about a response to Astrid. I'm gonna ask her a question about your presentation, Rachel. So, so Astrid, in part, my earlier question to Rachel was um, keeping your earlier work on, you know, the time of the slime and, um, you know, uh, fish kills that emerge with red tide. So, so in your earlier work, you've written about like the waste stream from hog farms. And, and I can imagine, um, you know, these human waste streams producing similar population dynamics. Whether, I don't know if it's toxic dinos or if it's Dinoflagellates, um, for, for those of you who haven't read Astrid's work. Um, so, so I guess, you know, like here, here we have, you know, hope and despair maybe as, as like we, we've got a, a, a microbial and viral um, politics of hope and also one of despair. And I think it's hope and despair for whom in these milieus. Um, I think at the same time that, you know, some interesting biopolitical and microbiopolitical work is being done with the sewage surveillance. Um, I think as we delve deep into these microbial worlds, you know, the downstream ecologies, you know, we also have to be mindful of who's, who's living and dying in those multi-species worlds. So, so I guess, you know, it's, it's both a question to you, Astrid, and then back to you, Rachel, just like, how do you think about the, those viral uh, politics of, of hope and despair in in the um, undercommons, as as Rachel term, termed it, in, in these microbial worlds that proliferate in, in the aftermath of of, of human uh, waste ecologies. How do I think about hope and despair? Um, well, fighting viruses as a war, I think, is a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, um, of course, uh, viruses create destructions, right? And also marine viruses, they kill bacteria. And, but it's not all, um, I think there are possibilities to read so some things differently, right? So we, we, I think we are stuck to, we cannot live without viruses as a point of my paper, right? We cannot, the human species would go extinct if there wouldn't be viruses on earth anymore, right? So, so that, just to point that out. Uh, so that maybe could put the, the, the current pandemic into, so some of the discourse around viruses is, is just not very, very helpful, I think. Um, so, but, um, there is also hope in other mode of attention to me, right? So um, there is, it's not all, um, so you can, some, some of, some stories can be read, um, yeah, both very uh, pessimistic and um, can be turned around with another mode of attention to something more optimistic. I guess it's the most general answer I can can give to that. Evelyn Grumpy, um, I, I, I hear. <laughs> or James but, uh, Clifford, maybe. I, wanted, I wanted to go back to scale zone. I wanted to extend this question to to, to Shia. Um, since you also mentioned um, multiple chaos on uh, multiple scales and multiple vulnerabilities, so that maybe can, we can get into this. Um, yeah, is is a microbiopolitics actually? Uh, um, how relevant is it, the micro scale for the microbiopolitics and for the? Uh, do we get to to different notions? Maybe that that trying to relate this now to to Evan's question about uh, about hope and despair, but maybe yeah, how significant the scale for that? Um, 
yeah i mean i think actually it's a, this is a really good point and it's a um it's a point that i think i, I was trying to make as well that um in in a sense the this idea that to govern something you have to be able to see it like you have to know what it is so also the the kind of uh the impetus to visualize something is often kind of the beginning of um governing uh or or, or trying to um contain it or try, trying to um, govern it to some to some extent and kind of um, accepting it as a part of somehow a human uh, perceivable purview, right? Um, so I think uh, that that's really interesting in, in the sense of like all, all the questions around visualizing the invisible and uh, at a, at a uh, micro uh, uh, scopic scale. But also, I think this this thing of what you're saying about hope and despair relates to this as well, because I think um, being able to visualize something on the one hand is is a kind of first step towards governance, but it's also the first step towards kind of some kind of act of uh, revolution in, in a sense, right? So, like, I think if unless you are able to kind of visualize uh, inequalities at a multi-scalar level, you also can't act at, a, at a, or organize uh, at, at those levels. Um, so I think that's particular, like, so, so I think this multiscalarity is really important also to the ways we um, artists and kind of theorists uh, think about how, um, why visualizing is important uh, in, in a kind of social political um, realm um, as well. And how, and how that kind of, it has to be at both kind of the, uh, the microscopic scale as well as, you know, kind of constantly relating to, to much larger uh, scales. So yeah, really good uh, point. Rachel, do you want to jump in? There was a couple of questions that pointed your way. Yes. Um, I, I, I'll swing back to the, you know, the question of the extended multi-species um, communities and then try to loop into what um, Astrid um, or Astrid, sorry, that was you. Um, and then loop into what you uh, asked, Eben. Um, but this idea of, you know, is this simply you know, like governance of human populations um, or is there sort of this extended multi-species, uh, you know, community um, reflection going on? And I, I mean, my sense is that it is a, uh, it, it's very much sort of using uh, microbes as a tool for, um, to serve, you know, human, human needs uh, of, uh, not just monitoring and 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 surveillance, but particularly uh, management, and um, and so yes, there is this sort of kind of ger question about germs management going going on uh, for uh, for sure. But that also, uh, but it, it leads me to wonder, you know, about the you know the ecologies of these my these uh, microbial worlds that are. Um, that that are there, and I want to circle into something that Astrid said, and that was, you know, the sort of <laughs> you're worrying about, you know, kind of a hyper focus on fighting viruses as sort of like the the focus, and that I think is the the you know the the question for for me here too, um, and and uh, I mean on the one hand, this is frame surveillance and ma and maintenance and management are framed as the hopeful frontier. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, I feel like part of it is I don't know what that means for, um, you know, questions about human justice and, and community level justice here in, in different hands, in different contexts. But I also am uncertain about what that means when you're isolating one thing and then searching for it. And um, I mean, there are so many grant examples of the use of this method to, you know, hyper-focus on, on one on one thing uh, beyond the the its ecological context, then in these new in in, in waste in, in this case in waste streams, um, so there's there's that. Uh, but um, but yeah, it seems right now that the 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 framing of it is very much Astrid, this sort of you know this is for governance purposes for for human uh, human bodies. But it leaves me with a big question. I mean, when you it, when you're getting these you know PCR you know uh, readouts, the, the, there are these complexities too. For instance, no you know no uh, no evidence, even though there is you know that there's clinically that there's an outbreak in a place or. 
Um, you also have um, uh, presence of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and um, it, it could mean something entirely different. Uh, so the, the use of documenting and then managing presence is really um, tricky uh, to, to me. And uh, I don't know yet about the, the other part of your question about the extended kind of multi-species community. I think I can see it in different lights in different laboratory uh, uses. For, you know, and I think I mentioned earlier about you know microbiome studies um, would be a way to sort of hyper illuminate uh, ecologies. Um, but the flip side is this kind of use for uh, the, the the war metaphor um, of using this as a strat as a kind of war strategy again against uh, outbreak for the purposes even of in the case of say campus and dormitories for the purposes of returning to you know face to face to face uh, life on campus and and living with viruses but i don't i mean i think there have been some really compelling arguments right now uh, and concerns about about that uh, the politics of that as well so i th those are kind of the things that i'm tussling with as i uh, delve into that uh, this world wonderful well i, I want to thank our three speakers tonight um, and also uh, plug again the second component of the Viral Politics Virtual Symposium, which is going to take place this Friday in Australia um, in other parts of the world that might be on late on a Thursday. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you, Sria. And, and I also want to um, acknowledge the hard work that's been done tonight behind the scenes by Maria Seaton. And, and also my colleagues in the Viral Politics Project. So, so the name Viral Politics comes from a book title um, uh, that Vanessa Lem, uh, the, the executive dean uh, here in uh, uh, Deakin University for Arts and Education, and my, uh, uh, Miguel Vater, um, who's a colleague of mine in the Alfred Deakin Institute. So they're, they're organizing a book on um, COVID-19 and viral politics. Uh, the event tonight comes out of that book and, and also um, the multi-species reading group discussions that Rachel Vaughn has, has been coordinating with me and that Sria and Astrid have been participating in. So thank, thank you uh, to everybody tonight. I thought it was a brilliant set of talks and a really generative discussion and uh, wish you all a good day and a good night. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Bye.